God doesn't really need time. Mm -hmm. I mean, he lives in the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And yet, God in his wisdom gave us time. It's the way we measure anniversaries. It's the way we measure birthdays. And some dates give us hope over other dates. And one of those, for some reason, just happens to be New Year's Day. Because we can sort of try to say good riddance to all the things that happened in the previous year and start over. That's why we have these things called New Year's resolutions. And one of the memes that, met, that uh, hit me hard was for all those people who made New Year's resolutions and then said, I think I'll wait till Monday. Congratulations. But that's me. I, I, I was going to, first day of the year, I was going to be at the gym. I woke up and I said, let's wait till Monday. So, but, but the good thing is, you know, we're walking into this new year. The slate's clean. You know, we haven't had much chance to mess it up yet. And I don't know if you've ever heard of good riddance there or not, but in New York City, there's actually this 14-year-old tradition, you might make it one of mine, uh, called Good Riddance Day. And it's celebrated every December 28th in Times Square. Now, this year it was a little different because it had to be mostly virtual. But it's inspired by a Latin American tradition where at New Year, people take this great delight in stuffing dolls, dolls, more like the baby dolls, with all their past bad memories of the previous year. You know, all the things that caused them to have bad memories or, or the things that represented the things they did wrong that year, that represented the things they wanted to get rid of, and they stuff them and then they set the dolls on fire. Not a bad deal. New York does it a little different. Uh, what they do is they, write all their unpleasant memories, their embarrassing moments, their downright unwanted memories, and then they put them through a paper shredder, sort of like confetti, and uh, they just celebrate. Wipe, it's like wiping the slate clean, looking for a, a better New Year. So this year, you know, what they, the organizer of it asked people to write down on paper all their grievances, uh, all the things that, that just caused them to have bad memories, or the things that went wrong in 2020, and throw them into a, a paper shredder and tear them all up and then put them in like a pinata. And I'm thinking, you know, all the dumb choices I made, all the grudges maybe I had, you know, all those things that are dirty up and on the inside and messing up your thoughts, they're just saying good riddance to them. Now, as you might imagine, uh, it, was a, it was a pretty popular holiday tradition this year. Uh, even though the people had to meet virtually, as you might imagine, COVID-19 was right there at the top of the list. I mean, really, when you think about it, I don't know about you, but how many of us wouldn't like just to take a whack at 2020 and send it all the way to the moon, you know what I mean? And, and there were people that, you know, of course, like I said, good riddance, COVID-19 was right there at the top of the list, but there were other things that people wanted to say goodbye to. Um, you know, one guy said, uh, I want to say good riddance to social distancing because it's hospitality and not being together, just don't, don't go together. You know what I mean? It's hard to be hosp hospitable to people when you can't even get near them. Another guy said, I'm gonna say good riddance to COVID-19, social distancing, bad energy, all my fake friends. <coughs> Somebody said, I'm gonna say, you know, good riddance to masks. I would love to say good riddance to masks. And uh, one, of, one of the ladies said, I don't wanna say, Good riddance to virtual schooling. It was a year of no schooling, a year of no learning. And really, I think about it, after this year, how many of us wouldn't like to say good riddance to 2020? Now, let's be honest, there, there's a lot of good things happening in 2020. But this year is probably going to go down in the history books. I can't imagine a history teacher 10 years from now trying to explain to their elementary school age children all the things that took place in 2020. I'm ready to smash the piñata. I, I'm ready to get rid of the shredded many memories. I'm ready to move into 2021. And I'm hoping to do so in such a way that I overcome this year. And uh, I, think, I think God's Word teaches us how to do that. Now, I don't know if you've been coming here for a while. Uh, I usually try to have an overriding theme for the year every year. And if you were here last year, you might remember, was 2020 hindsight gives us 2020 insight so that we can have 2020 foresight. Well, about 45 days into the year, that thing went, <laughs> went backwards because all of a sudden we're battling this disease that we hadn't even heard of at the beginning of the year. So it was hard to have any 2020 hindsight. But 
If you're like me, 2020 didn't exactly turn out like I thought it would. I, I was able to rejoice in the Lord. I had my hope in Him, and I had the peace and the joy and the love and all the things that we celebrate. But I had plans. For example, here at the Odyssey Church, we were in the process of relaunching. And our relaunch date was Easter Sunday of last year. Little did I know, like I said at the time, that this pandemic would hit us, a disease that we hadn't even heard of at the beginning of the year. And not only would we not be able to open at Easter, we actually had to close our doors for a period of time starting the week right before Easter. So it was the exact opposite of what we wanted. So instead of having an override hitting theme like that, this year I thought I'd do something a little different, just simply how to overcome 2021. How do we have the peace and the love and the joy and the hope that we have in the Lord in 2021, when so much of it, I think, last year was taken away from us. I think in 2021, and I'm speaking for myself, some of us need to stop hiding and we need to start living again. We need to make the decision to let whatever we're going through, not to take us down, but let it lift us up. And that's sort of what I said. I said, what I love about New Year's, we sort of get a, a fresh sight. Uh, uh, it represents new possibilities. It represents new potentials. There's this blank canvas. There's no margin, no lines, and there's possibilities. And that's part of the challenge, isn't it? I mean, if you think about it, on that blank canvas, it would be a whole lot easier to paint if it was a paint-by-number set. But the thing about the paint-by-number set, it doesn't give you any creativity. That blank canvas gives us the opportunity for more creativity, for more success, for more enjoyment. But like 2020 has shown us, it may not be as easy as we think it is. Inputs don't always match the outputs. And there's no guarantee that if I do this, I'm going to get this. Our goals, our marriages, our finances, our health, and there's so many other things that just sometimes work against us instead of work for us, and things don't work out like we were hoping so. But Winston Churchill made this statement, success is not final, and failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So as rough as 2020 has been on some of us, if you were successful, that's not necessarily final, and if, you were, if things were bad for you, it's not fatal. The courage is that we get back up and we move again. I think the answers to how to do this can be found in some very well-known scriptures. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, you know you should have your Bibles. Uh, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and we're just going to be looking at five verses, 12 through 16. And if you don't have a Bible, or you don't have a Bible in a, a translation you understand, I have plenty of them back there on the counter, and you're welcome to have one. They're free, there's no charge, because we know that many books inform, but there's only one book that transforms, and that is the Bible. So, if you want one, let me know. As tradition is, we'll be reading from the New Living Translation this year. And in just these five verses, we see three things that tell, uh, tell us how to overcome in 2021. In these, just these couple of verses, Jesus is going to tell us to engage, to inspire, and to thrive. Engage, inspire, and thrive. So the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and I'm going to read through the first verses, and then we'll go back and we'll look at them what they call exposition style. We'll sort of break them down. Jesus says, This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because the master doesn't comply to his slaves. Now you are my friends. That's amazing. You are friends of Jesus since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we thank you for your word. Lord, let us find much encouragement. Father, as we go into 2021, Father, let us look forward, not backwards. Let us learn from our lessons and our mistakes, but the rearview mirror is always smaller than a windshield because we're going forward, we're not going backwards. And let this be the year, Lord, that some of us break loose the chains that have been holding us back. Let us, Lord, not just endure, but let us enjoy 2021. Not just survive, but to thrive as well. And we ask this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. So Jesus starts out with his words. Here is my commandment. 
love each other in the same way that I love you. See, what he's saying is you're not created to be alone. You're not created to, to be a, a, an island all by yourself. In that song we sang this morning, it was talking about how God is pleased when we're together. God's pleased when we're in unity. And I, I know that so because it's not just written in one place in the scripture. It's written everywhere. In other words, what God is telling us in the very beginning is we need to be engaged. We need to engage with others. We aren't created to go it alone. In fact, I don't know anybody that has made it on their own all by themselves. You know, even the most successful businessman who says, I started with nothing and now I have everything, had people along the way that helped them out. And I see that at the very beginning of creation, God shows us that we're to begin to be in, engaged in relationships with other people, with himself and with others. And of course, first of all, it starts with himself. God separates the light from the darkness. God separates the water by making the sky. So you have the water in the sky, you have the water below. He then creates the land and the seas. He creates the plants and the trees. He creates the sun and the moon and the stars. Then he creates the birds and the fishes and all the creatures of sea. And after this, he creates all the animals. And finally, on the sixth day, God steps back. All creation is done. And on the seventh day, he rests. And all along the way that he's doing this, including on the seventh day, he gives a benediction. Benediction means good saying. Benny good from the Latin dictation, diction, benediction, good saying. He looks around, and every time he creates something, he says, it is good. But then you're not even halfway through the second chapter, or just about halfway through the second chapter of the entire Bible, and the mood suddenly sort of shifts, and God looks around and says, I see something that's not good. It is not good. It's a malediction. It's a bad saying. The very first malediction in the Bible is God sees that Adam is alone and he says it is not good for man to be alone. See, God created us to be in, engaged in relationships with himself and with, with everyone else. In the very beginning, he knew that relationships, engagement with others uh, were important. We need that so that we can deal with our loneliness, so that we can deal with our failures, so that we can celebrate together. <coughs> Being together just simply makes life easier. It helps us handle our fears. It helps us handle our frustration. It also gives us people to celebrate with us and rejoice with us when things are going good. But really, if you think about it, it goes against everything that our culture is teaching us today. It goes against everything that we're being taught in motivational speaking and what we're taught in schools. Because in today's world, the songs are like, I did it my way. I've got to be independent. i got to be me. Do what I want. I, need, I don't need anyone in my life to be happy. And we think and we've been taught that happiness is a result of being independent. If I'm financially independent, I'm going to be wealthy. I'm going to be happy. If I'm relationally independent, I don't rely on nobody else but myself, so I'm happy. If I'm independent in every way, then I'm going to be the happiest that I can be. But if you just look at 2020, you can prove that theory absolutely false. We see that it simply isn't true. I, I look around the world, and I don't think I've ever seen so many unhappy people. I mean, really, in today's world, everybody is angry. I don't know if you know this or not, but the suicide rate is way up. In fact, in Japan, suicide rate exceeds the COVID-19 right now. Last year was uh, uh, drug overdoses were the highest in the history of the land. People aren't happy. People are seeking something because we've been isolated. We haven't been able to engage. There's more murder and more violence than ever before. I think just in Chicago alone, there was almost, not quite, but almost 800 murders. It's almost two a day, more than two a day. So independent isn't the answer. It wasn't true in the beginning of the times, and it's not true now. 
And when pa Apostle Paul, he's one of my heroes, uh, not just because of what he was and what he became, because you know he says he's the chief of all sinners, but the only reason he can say that is because I wasn't born yet. Mm -hmm. I, I probably hadn't been. I still ain't Christian yet. Yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, he told them, and now he's telling us through, uh, I said uh, Christians in Corinth, I, 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 that might have been Rome, I'm sorry. I think it's Romans chapter 12, verse 5 in the Living Bible. It says, just as there are many parts of our body, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to make it complete. I mean, we can't do it on our own. He says, for each of us has different work to do, so we belong to each other, and each needs all the others. Each one of us needs other people. Paul is making that very clear. I need you, and, and you need me, and if we don't engage with each other, we both lose out. Not just do I lose out, but you lose out. If I don't have you with me, then I lose out. You know, I need others to walk with me. I need others to hold me accountable. And you need other people to walk with you. And we grow together, and we learn together in every area of our lives. Now, one thing I will tell you, and, and Jesus said that too, and he'll say, we'll read it later, is be very careful who you engage with. Because you engage with the wrong person, and then you may not become the person that God designed you to be. When you drop a white cloth into a dirty mud puddle, the dirty mud puddle don't become clean. It's the white cloth that gets dirty. So be careful who you engage with because those people shape your thoughts and they shape your actions. But as you read God's word, it becomes very obvious we aren't meant to walk alone. One of the reasons we're to engage with others is one reason, it's just simply safer. You know, when you, especially on college campuses and things like that, they tell people never go out alone. Always go out in groups. There's safeties in numbers. Secondly, when we engage with others, we find support. It keeps us from giving up. If it hadn't been for some of the people in this church, I'd probably give up a long time ago. But when I seem like well, God knows when I'm at my worst point, and he always sends somebody there to lift me up. There's safety in numbers. We find support in numbers. There's an old Zambanian, uh, Zambanian uh, saying, it goes something like this, when you run alone, you run fast. But when you run together, you run far. See, life isn't a 50-yard dash. Life is a marathon. We need people running beside us. We need to be engaged with others. They need to, so that they can help us go far. And finally, number three is it's simply smarter. You're going to learn a whole lot more when you go through life with other people. You learn from their experiences. They learn from your experiences. There are things that you don't know that they know, and there's things that you know that they don't know. It's, it's, it's smarter. When you're walking alone, you might even be going in the wrong direction, and there's no one there to turn you around, so you go in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I just read a story about a guy who didn't have money for bus, in China, um, didn't have money for the bus fare, so he rode his bike home. He just had to ride 130 miles in the wrong direction before he realized it. If he'd have been with somebody else, somebody probably would have said, well, you're going the wrong direction. Now, me personally, I think after 130 miles, maybe even after the first 20 miles, I might have realized I was going the wrong direction. But here was a man who was trying to go along the road 130 miles in the wrong direction. So if you want to overcome in 2021, the first thing we have to do is engage with others, starting with our Heavenly Father, and then engage with other people. And you have to be purposeful about it. Don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. Second thing, I think he just shows it. He says it like this. He says, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, we're here. That doesn't mean we have to be perfect by God's grace. But it does mean that we should be walking in the direction of the cross with an occasion of sin, not walking in the direction of sin with the occasion of walking towards the cross. He said, I no longer call you slaves as a master has confided in slaves. Now you're my friends, and I've told you everything the Father has told me. Now you might say, well, you know, if you haven't told me everything, the Father hasn't told me everything that he knows, how can I be Jesus' friend? He's told you everything he knows. It's right here. All you have to do is read it. So when we engage with others, we're simply better off. I mean, King Solomon, who some consider to be the wisest man to ever walk the earth besides Jesus Christ himself, tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we'll look at a longer section of this in a little while, 
In chapter 4, verse 12, it says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple graded uh, cord is not easily broken. Engaging with others is safer, it's more supportive, it's smarter, and all these things are important. But how do we live our lives with this passion and enthusiasm that we just read here? I think Jesus is telling us after we engage with others, we need to begin to inspire others. We need to get inspired ourselves, and then we need to inspire others. And I think it'd be hard to argue the fact that Jesus Christ was the most inspirational person, man, God, that ever walked the earth. There's been more books, more songs, there's been more paintings, there's been millions of sermons preached about him, and he's the main character in the number one selling book and the number one read book in all the world, our Bible. And God has given us this new year, maybe a year to turn some things around for some of us. You know, to dream out the dreams that, that we had and we want. Uh, you know, certain things we thought would happen in 2020 didn't come true, but maybe this year our dreams can become a reality. But we can't just do it on our own. We need to engage with others, and then we need to become inspired, and then we need to inspire others. The English word inspired means to breathe or to inhale. Breathe in or inhale. Something like gives you oxygen, something which gives you inspiration. Something that inspires you to be something that you're on. And inspiration can come from a lot of different sources. I mean, I've heard about people who entire careers were inspired by something that happened to them as a child. Or maybe somebody was inspired to be a teacher by a teacher that they had in school. When you look at some of the greatest artists, like Michelangelo, uh, he was a great artist and great inventor. Uh, uh, I heard that he got his inspiration from the clouds in the sky sometimes. He would get inspiration from their shapes. He would get inspiration by, co by combining two random thoughts together. And you've heard about great musicians that were inspired by other great musicians, and that their music is sort of inspired off of what they have. And when you look at inspiration, there's basically two kinds of inspiration. There's divine inspiration, and then there's human inspiration. You know, these Greek literary works that were inspired by authors like Shakespeare and C.S. Lewis and Hemingway, and so much, you know, so much music that was inspired by other artists. You know, really, when you look at it, you get talking to the people that had great success and great inspiration, whether it be business, whether it's an artist, no matter what, what area of life they've chosen, they're almost always inspired by somebody else. The Bible tells us that it's divinely, not humanly, inspired. And these ancient manuscripts, these letters, and that's really what they were. They were manuscripts and they were letters, and we put them together and we combine them. They call it, call it a Bible. The Bible claims itself to be divinely inspired. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do right. Now, in Greek, the word for inspired is not inhale in. It's actually a Greek word, theo, uh, and Bobby can correct me, I know I misspelled it, theo nuostos, and uh, it means God breathed, God breathed out. The Bible tells us itself that God inspired the Bible. God inspired itself, meaning it wasn't brought about by human inspiration, but God used real people. He used their real life experiences. He used their real personality to pass his word on to us. But when you think about it, ultimately God is in some way the source of all inspiration. Human inspiration is just us inhaling or breathing in some part of God's creation or revelation, whether it's a general revelation through somebody else or whether it's through God's creation or through his word. Personally, some of God's creation is giving me the greatest inspiration and his, his word is where I get most of my inspiration from. Cicero, who was a Roman philosopher, said no one ever great, no, no one ever did anything great without some portion of divine inspiration. So as I read that, I start thinking to myself, what are the questions we should be asking ourselves? And some of the ones that I came up with were, 
Well, who inspires me? What inspires me? Where do I find inspiration? Maybe these are some questions that you should ask yourself. You know, who inspires me? What inspires me? Where do I find inspiration? And then, who can I inspire? Who do I inspire? You know, like I said, I get a lot of my inspiration. It comes from reading. It comes from, I, listen, I like to listen to podcasts. I like to listen to other pastors. I read other sermons. I like to particularly read and study God's Word. And, and I find inspiration and inspiration for myself and hopefully I can inspire others as I do that as well. But I know, and hopefully now you know, we can only inspire other people if we engage with other people. If we get inspired and we're all by ourselves, it means nothing. So what should we, you know, I think the thing is that we should aspire to live this life which inspires others. So one of the ways that we overcome in 2021 is we remember that God simply loves us. Sometimes we just walk through the days and we forget how much he loves us. God assures of this. He writes through his, Jer uh, his prophet Jeremiah in chapter 29 verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. These are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and to give you hope. If you engage with others and you are inspired, and you're inspired by God and you're inspired by his work, over time, your daily actions and your daily words will begin to change, but so will those that you engage with. They'll see it in you and they'll want it for themselves. And whether you realize this or not, everybody inspires someone. If you're a parent, you're inspiring your or and your kids. If you're if you're at work, you're inspiring or influence, maybe influence is a better word because you're either getting them to do, become worse or you're getting them to become better. And what do your actions and your words say about you? Because you should never take your influence for granted. There's lives at stake. If you have children, your influence, their lives, their futures are at stake. Your aspiration should be a life of inspiration for God's adoration. We all leave a legacy of some kind behind. We forget that sometimes, but when you leave this earth, you will leave a legacy. Knowingly or unknowingly, we are all sending a message to our family, to our friends, to our co-workers, anybody we engage with based on our daily actions. What is your legacy going to be? What are your actions pointing to? Are they pointing to the cross or away from the cross? Are you pointing towards hope and peace and joy and love that's found in Jesus Christ, or are you pointing away from it? So in order to overcome in 2021, we need to engage with others. None of us can get through this alone. None of us can overcome alone. Secondly, we need to inspire and be inspired. We need to pay attention to who influences us and how we influence others. You know, there's a saying, what goes in comes out. You put garbage in, garbage out. God in, God out. Somebody gave a one-word sentence of your life. If they wrap everything of your life up into one word, what would it say? What would that word be? So we need to choose purposely. Every day of our lives, what we listen to and what we speak. Now Jesus tells us after we engage with others and are inspired by others and inspire, he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. See, I, I look at that, and even though Jesus was very engaged in the, um, in every aspect of every person, he was very careful who he spent his most time with. He said, I didn't choose you, you chose me, or I chose you, you didn't choose me. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. So we engage, we inspire, and then we thrive, not just survive. Life wasn't meant to endure, but to enjoy. And when we can engage with others, and we have the right people inspiring us, and we're, we're listening to God, then we should thrive, not just survive. I mean, Jesus tells us to thrive. He's appointed us to produce fruit that lasts forever. Like I said, life is to be enjoyed, not just endured. And what does Jesus tell us is going to happen if we produce fruit that lasts forever? He said, you can go to God the Father, you can go to my daddy, and you can ask anything you want, he'll give it to you. And you think to yourself, well, how does that happen? If this is true, why are so many of my prayers going unanswered? And I think 
the answer to a lot of that is that most of us are just surviving, not thriving. Most of us are just enduring, not enduring this journey we call life. Thriving's a mindset. You can thrive in the most uncomfortable conditions, whether your circumstances are horrible or whether they're fantastic. You personally can, can thrive. But how do we thrive under any circumstances? And, and I think you know what I'm going to say. You know, first answer is to be totally devoted to God. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23 says, Fear of the Lord leads to life, bringing security and protection from harm. Now, in this context, fear of the Lord doesn't mean to be afraid of God. What it means is to respect and to honor God, to be totally devoted to the Lord. My belief is, if I'm being led to life, if God is leading me to life, and I have God's security, and I have God's protection from harm, then I'm doing more than just surviving. I'm thriving. And when I'm thriving, God's answering my prayers because now my heart is in alignment with God's heart and I'm asking for His will to be done. You know, the reason we engage first instead of thriving first is because when we're thriving, we're enjoying the blessings of the work and the relationships that we have with others. Solomon writes, this in the book of Ecclesiastes, and we mentioned part of it earlier, but I'm going back to uh, a little bit back farther in chapter 4. He said, I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can, but then he asks himself, why am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It's all so meaningless and depressing. You know, I've said it before, I, I say it again, some of the happiest people that I've ever met are the people that financially have virtually nothing. And some of the most unhappy people that I've ever met are the ones that have everything financially. They work so hard to get it, but they can't enjoy it. They're, sort of, they're walking alone. The lack of engagement is like something meaningless under the sun. It, it makes someone feel meaningless. It makes them feel depressed. There's no support system. There's lack of efficiency when we're working alone. Solomon goes on to explain this in the next verses. We read some of them earlier. Two people are better off than one. Who they can help each other succeed. Two can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But if someone falls all alone, is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two standing back to back can conquer. Three or even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And folks, I'm a realist. I mean, I know life is hard. Harder at other times than it is at other times. I mean, my life has been hard at times. Maybe you don't like your job, or maybe your marriage is on the rocks, or maybe the bills are more than your income. Maybe you had a bad doctor's report, or somebody you've been hurt, you love has been hurt in some way, or with, with this pandemic, that's been going on. Maybe someone has gotten sick and passed away. and There's just so many things that can come to bring us down. But I want you to know, and God wants you to know, He didn't create you just to barely make it. He didn't put you on the earth to spend time wishing away your days. God desired for you to thrive, not just survive. God wants you to live an abundant life. In fact, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, this is one of the reasons God came down from heaven to dwell among his people. Jesus says this in John 10, 10. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Another translation reads, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. God has a specific, person, a specific purpose for each one of you. He has a specific person for, uh, purpose for me. And he said that purpose is to give you a, a rich and satisfying life. To live life and to live it to the fullest. To enjoy life, not just endure life. So in order to overcome in 2021, stop settling for less than what Jesus Christ has already paid for with his blood and on a cross. Stop settling for less than he wants you to have. There's only one person, there's only one person who can prevent you from living the abundant life that God desires you to have, and that person is the person you look at every morning in the mirror. The 
The only person that can keep you from thriving is yourself. So in order to live out this abundant life that God created to live, first we have to engage with others. And, and like Jesus said, I didn't choose you. You, chose, I, you, I, you didn't choose me. I chose you. You chose the people that you want to engage with. And the first person you should engage with is our loving Heavenly Father. He offers us life. He offers us security. He offers us protection. Take and get engaged in a relationship with the one who came so that you can have this rich and satisfying life. So as you engage with a, a relationship, a true relationship with the living God through prayer, and through reading on his word, through meditation, as you do, I promise you, because I've never seen anybody do it that did, he will begin to inspire you. And as God inspires you, you're going to go out and you're going to inspire others. As you inspire others, you're going to find your purpose. And once you've found your purpose, not only do you do more than survive, you actually begin to thrive. As you begin to thrive, then those around you begin to thrive. You'll be producing fruit which lasts forever. And you can ask the Father anything in the name of the Son, and he'll give it to you. Because your heart's in alignment with his heart. So let me begin to close. And notice I said begin to close. By, by giving you just a few steps on how to engage, inspire, and thrive. So that all of us together can overcome in 2021. A new year, new possibilities, new potential. And we may start with what may be the most difficult, but almost often, but is also the most important step. And that is simply to do what the scriptures tell us to do from the very beginning to end. Repent and believe. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is near. And repent doesn't simply mean stop doing what you know you ought not be doing or start doing what you know you ought to be doing. It really, in its simplicity, means to change the way you think so you change the way you act. Stop thinking about yourself less and start thinking about God and others more. How many of you realize that the most selfish people in the world are almost always the most unhappiest people? The more you give, the more you inspire, the more you inspire, the more you'll thrive. And God doesn't, here's a great part, God doesn't require us to jump through hoops to receive the salvation from his wrath we deserve because of his sin, or our sin. He says just come by simple faith alone, that's all. But faith is so important to God that the author of the book of Hebrew writes in chapter 11, verse 6, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It's impossible to please God without faith. Secondly, as we seek to engage with God so we can engage properly with others, we need to pray and meditate on God's word. Prayer is basically us talking to God and meditation is listening, waiting for God to talk to you. And some people say, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't know enough about the Bible. You don't have to know a lot about the Bible to pray. You don't have to be fancy and religious to pray. <coughs> Just talk to God like he's your friend. Remember Jesus said in the verse we read before, I am your friend now that I have given you what your Father has given me. And Paul, the great apostle Paul, he tells us in several places in his letters, just to, here's just a few, how to pray. He gives us a lot of advice on how to pray. He tells us in his, letter, in his letter to the Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, bring your requests, be made known to God. In the book of Colossians, Paul writes, devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. First Thessalonians, Paul gives this advice, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now notice as he, all, all those verses, when you look at them, prayer, thanksgiving, prayer, thanksgiving, prayer, thanksgiving, prayer, thanksgiving. As we come to God, we have to be thankful. We ask him for what we don't have, but we're very thankful for what we do have. As you begin to deepen your relationship with God, you'll become inspired. And as you become inspired, you're going to inspire others. Your daily habits, your daily actions, will begin to inspire those around you. 
And you'll be producing fruit that lasts forever. And if you're producing fruits that last forever, then you're doing more than surviving. You're doing more than enjoying. You're thriving and enjoying. So to overcome in 2021, engage with God the Father and let him lead you who you should engage with in others. Become inspired by God. And as you do, begin to inspire those around you. And as you engage with God, as you engage with others, as you're inspired, as, as you inspire others, then you'll begin to thrive, not just survive. And the good news is, as you begin to thrive, you will make fruit that lasts forever. And that means those around you begin to do more than just survive. You're inspiring them so that they will thrive as well. I don't know if you're familiar with an organization called Chrysalis. There's an adult version called Emmaus. But in the past, uh, I've been asked to be a spiritual director on the Chrysalis side. And Chrysalis is for uh, teenagers. And it's a, it's a three days of worship, three days of prayer and fellowship and creative expression and singing and recreation and discussion. And there's, a, you know, like I said, there's an adult version also called Emmaus. But in Christmas, they have a saying, which I think makes this formula of overcoming 2021 very easy to remember. And it's this. Make a friend. Be a friend. Lead a friend to Jesus. Engage. Inspire. Thrive. Make a friend. Be a friend. Lead a friend to Jesus. Now, can you imagine? And just think about this and, and try, to, try to look at it in your mind's eye. What our family, what our workplaces, what our city, what our community would look like if just the people within the sound of my voice did this in 2021. Don't you think we could more than survive in 2021? Don't you think we could actually overcome 2021 if we all made our minds up to take action, Amen. to be engaged with others, particularly those that we don't know, and, and begin engaging in new people and become, you know, engage with God so that we become inspired and then we inspire others so we can do more than just survive in 2021. If just the people in the sound of my voice would make a friend, be a friend, lead someone to Jesus, what a different world we would live in. But in order this, you have to make a conscious decision. You have to make a conscious decision to engage, to become inspired, and to inspire others and to thrive and then to help others thrive. It's got to take action in 2021 or it will be no different than 2020. So the question I want to ask you and I want you to think about is we going to take in the Lord's table this morning is simply this. Will I survive 2021 or will I choose, will I make the personal decision, will I take the action to overcome and thrive in 2021? Will I engage and inspire and thrive? Will I make a friend, be a friend, be a friend to Jesus? I'm going to pray, and then we'll partake in the Lord's service. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us free will, that it's our choice. We can choose to remain the same. We can choose to praise and be raised. Lord, we can make the decision to go out and engage with others, be inspired and to inspire. And Lord, that we can thrive in 2021, not just overcome 2021, but thrive in 2021. And we thank you in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And again this morning, we're going to take communion in the safest way possible. We'll use the, the three and ones. After that, um, there'll be one more song. And uh, during that period of time, if... Uh, um, we'll sing one more song and if you have a prayer need in any area of your life please let me know and I want to remind everybody you know really this is a symbolic act as we partake in the bread we're remembered of the body of Christ as we partake in the juice we're remembered of the blood of Christ and Jesus didn't come so that one person would be saved. He came so that we all could be saved. But he also knows we have short memories. So he gave us a way to remember what it cost him to have our salvation. And we call that communion or the Eucharist or the Lord's table. So the 
first thing you do is you just simply lift up the top and pull out the bread. I lift it up on the night in which he gave himself up for us. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to the Father, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this 